What's up guys, my name is Jake and welcome to Abandoned, episode 70. When Disney's Epcot Center opened in 1982, the hub of the park featured two massive kidney-shaped buildings which conceptually tied the entire Future World section and really the rest of the park together. It very much embodied Epcot's spirit and purpose, complementing the pavilions that populated it and expanded the scope of science and technology, making it a fun and palatable experience for its visitors. But after a while, and a little over a decade later, that spirit and purpose was shifted and the buildings were renamed to Innoventions. And if you visited Epcot prior to their eventual close, you'd know that the experience within were not exactly a must-do. In fact, those attractions and exhibits within were slowly shuttered over time until eventually large sections of these buildings were closed off and the contents inside left abandoned. So join me today as we discover what Communicore once was, how it changed so drastically through the years, and find out what ambitious changes are on the horizon, which themselves might even become abandoned. This is Epcot Center's Communicore. This episode has been brought to you by CuriosityStream. Get additional access to my streaming service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description below. After the Magic Kingdom opened in 1971, the Walt Disney Company was moving forward with their development of a second gate to their Florida site retaining the same name as Walt Disney's Epcot, but instead opting for a public showcase of culture, history, and technology. A sort of permanent World's Fair. This park went through a lot of radical design changes, mainly in where it was placed, how sections would be divided, and the overall layout. Even in the earliest designs from the late 70s, the concept of center buildings to complement their surroundings called Communicore stayed pretty consistent in all of them. The concepts behind these flanking buildings remained the same, as they were meant to expand on the ideas presented in each of the Future World pavilions, while also acting as a sort of Main Street USA for Epcot housing not only attractions, but food and retail offerings. At the crossroads of Future World is the Communicore, which the Disney people are calling the Main Street of Tomorrow. It will be a marketplace of ideas where the public will get a hands-on opportunity to sample the products and concepts of the future. The ultra-modern buildings were tagged as the global marketplace of new ideas, and would incorporate the use of high-tech computers allowing people to access world information and even plan their Disney vacation itinerary. In the later designs of Epcot though, the execution of this began to shift, as did the philosophy and vision of the entire park focusing more on entertainment mixed with education, rather than just the latter. With corporate sponsors secured and a finalized concept of both the exterior buildings and their interior exhibits, construction on Epcot Center began in 1979, with Communicore being one of the last structures to take shape just a few months before opening in October of 1982. Communicore opened alongside the rest of the park on October 1st and featured a wide variety of attractions and exhibits. Communicore was divided into two buildings, with technically four structures. Two sides under a continuous roof covering two outdoor walkways. We'll start with Communicore East, which acted as the gateway to the universe of energy, world of motion, and later horizons and wonders of life. Inside, you'd find the large quick-service Stargate restaurants and exhibits from companies like American Express and Exxon. There was also Computer Central, which was presented by Spare Univac. Epcot, after all, opened at the dawn of the consumer computer age, and it only made sense for Communicore to be a showcase of this new technology. For many, Computer Central was the first time people had ever seen computers, let alone try out a touchscreen. The other half of the building featured the multi-level Centorium store, which was Epcot's version of the Main Street Emporium. There was also the News Choice Theater, which played live satellite news and contained the Future Choice Theater, where guests could voice opinions on current events and take polls in a live forum. Moving over to Communicore West, Bell Systems Futurecom took a large section of the building with a massive interactive exhibit. Further down was information centers for teachers who were on school field trips, and a showcase of future attractions and Epcot information. Sunshine Terrace was another restaurant which acted as a quick service eatery. Finally in the building was a large space reserved for a future Tron arcade themed attraction. It made it pretty far in development, but was actually never built, and an Expo Robotics exhibit took its place in 1988. In between both Communicore structures would be guest walkways crossing a small series of ponds below. 
further down, the Fountain of Nations would serve as the gateway to the rest of the park in World Showcase. This was only the beginning though, as the Communicore buildings were designed to be expanded. The thought process was, was that when Epcot was entering its second phase of construction, exhibits within Communicore could be expanded with new physical space. So, the buildings were designed to be circular, with room for expansion all the way out to the monorail beam. Speaking of transportation, the primary corridors inside each building were intentionally designed to be over 20 feet high and wide open. This was to accommodate for the people mover system that was designed to circle through Future World. Just like in the Magic Kingdom's Tomorrowland, Future World would also have a Wedway People Mover system transporting guests around the first half of the park, traveling straight through the Communicore concourses. Now, these massive expansions never happened apart from a small rotunda around the Centorium and a rather large expansion at the Northwest Building. The rest were cancelled mainly due to budgetary reasons, but showed the wide scope Imagineers had for the area. Regardless, what was built was directly in line with the spirits of Epcot Center. A lot of exhibits served their purpose and did a great job at educating people. Other attractions though, like Future Choice Theatre, wasn't the success many had hoped it would be. There's no doubt that the exhibits sponsored by companies like Exxon also had a clear bias in what type of information they were displaying to the public. But otherwise, Communicore stood strong for many years as a place for people to learn, relax, eat, and buy futuristic toys and Epcot merchandise at the Centorium retail store. But things were changing at the company, and the era of leadership that designed and built Epcot were now being replaced. Michael Eisner became the company's new CEO, tasked to guide the company out of financial ruin and a hostile takeover mainly in part because the shareholders thought the company spent way too much money on Epcot Center. Which, I mean, they did. Meanwhile, Communicore continued to operate with its exhibits switched out for updated ones periodically. By the early 90s, the Walt Disney World Resort as a whole was expanding quite rapidly, with Epcot Center gearing up for an update, which wouldn't really materialize in full until the end of the decade. Still, management was set on revamping Epcot's version of Main Street, that of course being Communicore. Apparently, Michael Eisner had recently visited CES, or the Consumer Electronics Show, and thought it would be a good idea to replace the existing science and technology-based exhibits with a cohesive new theme of futuristic consumer technology. So, Imagineers began crafting something tangible with this new idea. Disney later announced Innoventions would be replacing Communicore by the mid-1990s. So, the exhibits within began closing between 1993 and 94, with the major overhaul beginning shortly thereafter. Innoventions East and West opened on July 1st, 1994, with quite a different look. Marvel at the car that never needs gas. Check it out! Play the most Sega games anywhere. Watch a TV larger than your living room. See a bathroom that cleans itself in the home of the future. Talk on a phone you wear on your wrist. You'll never guess where we're calling from. <laughs> Fly on virtual reality. Try a thousand new inventions that will change your life forever. Innoventions at Epcot 94. Basically, the design philosophy for this iteration was to lessen the natural light from the original massive windows of Communicore and generally section off spaces making everything darker. To compensate, the interactive shows and exhibits would be bold and bright using lots of neon and having the design mesh together as much as possible. I guess giving the idea of excitement and lots to do. It was all extremely 90s, and very busy from a design perspective, something of a trend in Future World at the time which could be seen at Global Neighborhood and later Test Track. Innoventions also featured a lot smaller exhibits from many, many more private sponsors. These included Honeywell, Lego, Sega, IBM, GE, GM, and even Apple computers. And that's just scratching the surface, there was a lot more. Electric Umbrella and Pasta Pizza Restaurante took over the food options, and Mouse Gear would replace the Centaurium. A character meet and greet was also added to the space, and foliage was planted around the exteriors of Innoventions, blocking the massive windows, again letting less light inside. 
Most of the elevation changes within the structures had either been removed or paved over to keep everything on one level, making the whole space feel a bit less dynamic. This all eventually caused issues, as visitors often got lost as the general atmosphere was so busy and so dark that it was kind of hard to navigate. So, just five years after it opened, both buildings went under yet another renovation, now adding a cartoon highway on the floor to help people through, creating a bit of a linear pathway. The tagline, Road to Tomorrow, was added to the name, making the theme a little more cohesive. The idea of corporate sponsors showcasing new technology all together in one format is an interesting one, and at a trade show it works pretty well since all the attendees are mainly press. In Innoventions though, it seemed pretty tacky overall. Some exhibits were literally just advertisements for products of the future for that company, which 9 times out of 10 never happened. Much of it was incredibly cheesy. Yet some were interesting, like the House of the Future, which was the most 90s futuristic home ever. Though they did get some futuristic technology right. This was all finished just in time for Epcot's Millennium Celebration, and really marked not only a new aesthetic design scheme for the whole park, but a general shift in direction as a whole. With just a god-awful Mickey wand stretching over Spaceship Earth, and now Horizons World of Motion, Universe of Energy all permanently closed, the future of Epcot was indeed rapidly changing. Through the early 2000s, some of the exhibits had been switched out and entirely new sections opened up like Ice Station Cool, a Coca-Cola retail store. Around this time, the Pasta Pizza Restaurante closed permanently with the space now being used here or there for character meet and greet. In the Hub Plaza, a new pin trading booth was set up as the center of a new canopy structure covering nearly half of the main pathways. Gone now were the ponds below, replaced by concrete. Really though, it wouldn't be until 2007 when more major changes to interventions were made. That former space of the Pasta Pizza Restaurante, I still don't understand why they called it that. What a terrible name. Anyway, that became a permanent character meet and greet. This year also saw the removal of the neon signs and theming outdoors, replaced by a very simple and very 2007 logo. No doubt that these exhibits began to look a bit tired, and perhaps a little dated, but to their credit, new exhibits and attractions were being added like the Great Piggy Bank Adventure, sponsored by T. Rowe Price, an investment firm, okay, and the Sum of All Thrills, presented by Raytheon. <laughs> <laughs> which that one was over in Interventions East. Some of All Thrills was actually pretty cool. It opened in 2009 and was a pretty state-of-the-art simulator where you can build your own roller coaster, then virtually ride it in VR on a robot arm with a pretty wide range of movement. This attraction also stood as the last ride to be built at Epcot that was not based on any existing IP. So that's depressing. 2012 also saw some additions like Habitat Heroes and Vision House, which was a modern take on the original futuristic home walkthrough concept. These were all fine, but if you walked around interventions during this era, clearly the draw to visitors was not like it was, and temporary walls began to occupy more and more of the wall space as exhibits closed one by one. By far the most popular attraction in there was some of all thrills, presumably accounting for most of the foot traffic inside interventions. By 2014, only seven unique exhibits were remaining inside both buildings. And by the next year, a very interesting announcement was made. Disney confirmed with the Orlando Sentinel that Innoventions West would be closing in May. A spokesperson from the company said, quote, We've reached the end of our sponsorship agreements with the exhibitors in Innoventions West, and will temporarily close the space in early May to begin preparing for a new experience. This new experience, though, was never specified. So, the entire pavilion closed in early 2015, leaving just Starbucks, a character spot, Art of Disney, and Club Cool, the new name for the Coke store. The rest of the building was left unused. Both buildings were also repainted with a puzzling new design that I truly just hate. Inside, the rest was more or less abandoned, while guests could still walk down the rather odd Limbo State Corridor, which was now sealed off from the former exhibits. As for Interventions East, well, in 2000, 
2016 with everything trending to an eventual closure itself, surprisingly a new exhibit was opened called Colortopia, presented by Glidden, and then yet another Spectacular presented by Murata Manufacturing. While this seemingly spelled new life for inventions, at the same time Habitat Heroes and some of all thrills were closed permanently. Vision House and a few others had already closed the year prior, leaving just Colortopia, an often not operating Spectacular, and a small nano research exhibit which opened all the way back in 2010. The rest, including some of all thrills, were left in their place behind a temporary work wall which had been placed there since its closing. The lights behind the walls were turned off, yet the massive, unlit signs could clearly still be seen over it. The small cracks in the fence showed the abandoned attractions still left in their place, shuttered and unused. With the former Road to Tomorrow leading, well, nowhere, it was quite symbolic of the future for intervention. And this is how things would remain for the next few years. Development plans for the buildings, and really all of Epcot, had been in the works for a considerable amount of time. Disney, of course, stated they were intending to bring a new experience to Innoventions West. But after that 2015 announcement, nothing happened. These redevelopment plans, in some form, can be dated all the way back to the early 2000s, with a project that never got off the ground called Epcot Discoveryland. This plan calls for what looks like sections of interventions to be demolished, while leaving the rest still standing and have them remain as fragmented individual venues. Trees would now fill the plaza and much more would be changed or added to the rest of Future World. This plan never materialized due to cost and the state of management higher up at the company. It wouldn't be until around 2015 when these plans were actually starting to heat back up. In this leaked concept art from around 2016 and 17, we can see a rather scaled back yet clear overhaul to Epcot's hub. In it, we can see that the continuous roof coverings over the gateways to the Future World sections would now be open. Trees and planters would fill the plaza, new lighting and modern designs to the Interventions buildings would take shape, and some futuristic small structures would be added. Really, all of this would have significantly upgraded what was already existing. Surprisingly though, this was never made public, and it seems that in this rare instance, Epcot's redevelopment budget would only increase from here. In July of 2017, Disney officially announced their ambitious intentions for Epcot. It was then when they announced a bunch of new things. Not all that great in my opinion, but they did show some concept art of the hub. In this rough overview, the theme of foliage occupying much of the land is pretty clear. Also clear is the complete removal of intervention. Now this was a rough drawing of the general direction the team was going in, and nothing here was really concrete. That wouldn't come until around summer 2019, when real concept art and details of this new overhaul for Epcot were released. And oh boy was it a lot. I'm going to keep everything in the context of interventions for the sake of time here, but basically three new neighborhoods were announced as World Discovery, World Celebration, and World Nature. This would divide up Future World and actually replace the Future World naming for East and West. Now, in this concept art, you'll notice that Interventions East does indeed remain standing. However, Interventions West would be demolished. Built on its massive footprint would be two structures. First, the Journey of Water, a walk through water trail that is inspired by Moana. Secondly, and more eye-catching, is the new Festival Center, a purpose-built modern structure to host the various Epcot annual festivals. This would also have various functions, with a plaza on the ground floor, a floor-to-ceiling glass-enclosed expo level, and a rooftop park. It's truly a striking and rather beautiful piece of architecture. As for Interventions East, well that building would be comprised of a new restaurant called the Connections Cafe and Eatery, a replacement for the Mouse Gear retail store called Creation Shop, and a new home for the relocated Club Cool store. The hub is also set for a dramatic transformation with the removal of the Fountain of Nations, now replaced with a much smaller fountain somewhat in the same spirit. Surrounding it would be abstract and colorful art installations spread out with a heavy emphasis on natural flowing environments. All of this was set to be built by 2023. Yeah, 
Through this whole time, Interventions was still open. The tiny portion of Interventions that wasn't a hallway or a disconnected meet and greet was incredibly depressing. It was more or less a place for visitors to escape the heat of Central Florida, and I bet very few people even knew it was here. Disney closed the remaining exhibits and locked the doors of Interventions East on September 7th, 2019. Shortly after, in July 2020, Interventions West was closed off and a lengthy work wall was erected around the fountain and the southern half of the building, where demolition finally began. As a considerable amount of the structure was being torn down, the world and its major companies began to enter a state of panic. A novel coronavirus was spreading around the world, and much of the United States went into lockdown. This caused Disney to react pretty dramatically. Epcot and actually all of Disney's American theme parks were closed indefinitely by late March. So, that's pretty bad timing for such a massive project well underway. To make matters worse, Bob Iger, the company's CEO, was in the process of handing over his executive position to the then Parks and Resorts head, Bob Chapek, a person who isn't exactly beloved in the theme park community. During this time, and unlike Universal, Disney basically halted all construction, not only at Epcot, but pretty much every major project they had active. While the parks eventually did reopen in July, Disney ended 2020 with a net loss of over $2.4 billion in their park division. This caused the company to shift their investment strategy to divisions that were making money at the time, like Disney+. Plus. And by 2021, investment in their park division had decreased over $1.8 billion from 2019, a level of investment that hadn't been that low since 2013. So, it would make sense why the hub of Epcot continued to stay in basically a limbo and abandoned state. The demolition of Interventions West only made it halfway through before everything was halted for nearly a year. Interventions East was the same and continued to sit basically untouched until around early 2021, when very slow work began on the creation shop on the south end of the former Interventions East building. Meanwhile, by March, the entire West building had finally been demolished. By September of 2021, that creation shop location finally did open, marking the first development of the building to reopen to the public. Soon after, in October, the new Club Cool store also opened up. But what about the Innoventions West site? Well, the Journey of Water thing finally started to see significant progress in early 2022. As for the Festival Center, well, the site where it's supposed to go has sat untouched, with foliage now breaking through. This put the site into question, and soon Disney removed the model of it from the Epcot Preview Center, and made a statement calling it, quote, a newly reimagined festival area. So, who knows what that means? But I think it could be strongly assumed that the former centerpiece of this whole new Epcot hub experience is no longer at the impressive scale it once was. And that brings us to now, with a pretty slow development happening across all the parks, with the last Interventions East development, that being the restaurant, opening up in 2022. The rest will probably be a while. It's been a long journey from where we came from, with two buildings fundamental to the philosophy of Epcot Center. A wild ride of ups and a lot of downs to this eventual and arduous redevelopment. Communicore was the ribbon that was supposed to tie all of Future World together, expanding on the many ideas the park posed to guests. While it gave millions of people a lot of great memories, not everything was a winner. I can't claim that everyone loved it. In fact, a lot of it was experimental, and much of the corporate stuff was pretty forgettable. When it transitioned to Interventions, it carried on that spirit, but got lost in the rapidly changing company and world. By the 2000s, it was nothing more than a pretty crap children's museum, and a cheap looking one at that, relying on those corporate sponsors, which really seemed more like advertisements disguised as games. By the end, nobody knew what to do with it, and left it in a pretty shockingly bad state for many years. Large sections of it completely abandoned right in the middle of the park. By at least 2012, the entire plaza was looking pretty tired, and no attempt of weirdly awful livery would change that. This looks like complete and total crap. I'll be honest, I'm pretty cynical and very skeptical of the modern-day Disney company, and especially how they'll take Epcot from here. 
Communicore was a very large piece of the puzzle for a very special and a very unique park, and its current trajectory is making it more of the same, which I think is a massive mistake in the long run. If I learned anything from making these videos for so long, it's that everyone is interested in learning about new things in a respectful, non-pandering way. Communicore probably wouldn't work today, but I think if it was appropriately and respectfully adapted for a modern day audience, it would be pretty unique. Regardless, I will say that while all the stuff that has been built inside of Communicore East has just been profit centers and no real substantial experience, the exteriors of the building and seeing it return to its modern day version of the original concept is cool to see. It's also nice to see those massive windows once again utilized, even if it is just for a painfully basic retail store inside. Not sure how this theme ties to Epcot, but okay. I think if they're able to see through their 2000 19 vision and promises, especially for the plaza, I think that really will, in some form at least, respect the original vision of Epcot. How long that ends up taking, though, is anybody's guess. But I think as long as there's a reminder of Communicore's past that still stands today, we'll always remember its purpose of inspiring and informing a new generation over 40 years ago. Let's remember that even before all of this happened, it all started with the vision for Epcot. Just a year before Walt Disney made his official announcement on Epcot, the company began buying land in Florida. If we're going down the company timeline a year before that, Walt Disney Pictures released the movie Mary Poppins, which also just so happens to be an IP that was intended to be brought to the new Epcot, but has also been abandoned or put on hold. There's actually a really interesting documentary about the real story behind the infamous production of that film and the tense relationship between Walt Disney and P.L. Travers. Thankfully, if you're interested in watching, you can find it on this video sponsor, CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a streaming service focused on curating high-quality non-fiction titles and documentaries across all types of topics. CuriosityStream has also been a big supporter of creators like me, and because of that, they have partnered with the streaming service that I have helped create, Nebula. Oftentimes, my fellow creators can't upload certain types of videos, whether they're too long or contain touchy history that YouTube loves to demonetize. So, Nebula was designed to be a place where people can go and provide special and exclusive content just for you. On my channel there, you can catch these videos a day early and ad-free, but Nebula also features a ton of exclusive, original content that you can't find anywhere else. So if you sign up using my link, curiositystream.com bsf, you'll get 26% off an annual plan. That's just $14.79 for the year to gain access to two amazing streaming platforms. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.